Okay, now we are recording, and uh, I'm going to put you back to full screen here. Okay, now I'm going to have to tell only the truth, nothing but the truth. Okay. <laughs> you want me to go back one, Larry? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go back one. There? No. There you go. There you go. Now we see it. All right. The main characters uh, are this woman, Helen, uh, Helen Jewett, uh, a gentleman by the name of Richard uh, P. Robinson, and then a news reporter by the name of James Gordon Bennett, who is an editor for the New York Herald. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, if you want to go, go to the next slide. See it? Yeah, there you go. Helen was a lady of ill repute from the time period. And on the evening of the third, early, uh, very early in the morning, um, she turned up dead in her room. Um, the, as the story goes, um, this murder occurred, and it was a mystery murder. But as you'll see as we go along, hopefully uh, you'll see how things are put in here. Now, I use historic photos here that are from various stories that covered this whole thing during the time period. Uh, because this became a real sensational thing. Um, everybody just ate up the story. The news media went nuts over it. If you go to the next slide, um, she's murdered in the middle of the, in the late at night. Nobody sees who did it. Nobody really knows who the person was that did it, but there are these circumstantial accounts by witnesses What's going on here? Go, that give information, little bits of information. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you read the account, which uh, I, I went through and read some of these accounts from the newspaper. Go to the next slide. Her body, by the way, was found uh, partially burned. The, the background photo you see here is the most probably the most accurate to what the murder scene was like. Um, her bed was was turned, was lit on fire and she'd been hit. She'd been hit on the head, uh, been killed by a blunt instrument of some sort. And then apparently during her sleep and had tumbled out of the bed, and whoever did this actually set the place on fire trying to destroy the scene. Um, and what happened is the uh, the uh, the madam of the house discovered her body and started this whole scene where all these people, a bunch of gawkers, rubberneckers, and everybody came to look in. There must have been a whole crowd of people that finally came in here along with the police. And what's interesting is... Uh, all these rubberneckers are forced out of the room, but the police let this editor come into the room uh, after they kick everybody else out. Bennett is left let into the room, and he, you know, he's declared he's a, he's a, he's an important person. He's uh, he's he's doing the public duty, so he comes into the room and he does this examination of everything. Go to the next slide. This is where it starts really getting interesting. Uh, Bennett, you know, duty he takes notes. Whoop, went too far. Okay, wait a minute. Did I miss a slide? Uh, yeah, I guess. Miss okay, well, the evidence from all these people points to well, there was this guy who was a frequent visitor at Helen's. His name was Robinson, and he was a up and coming, well to do guy, whereas Helen is a prostitute, a woman of ill repute, and all this other stuff. So, y'all instantly have this thing of people well to do against people with nothing. Um, there's evidence. This mysterious guy came in. Robinson would come to see her a lot, but nobody actually saw him, per se. But a man came to visit Helen that night with a cloak and concealed his face when he came in. So they didn't really see who he was. Um, but late at night, someone tried to get out of the house. This was evidently after Helen was killed. Couldn't get out the front door because of the way they arranged the keys to where the ladies would let the men out so that the madam wouldn't be disturbed and it worked very conveniently clients could come and go and and they had a really nice arrangement i you know i'm not that familiar with brothels so um that that sounds like that's how it was it was the way it worked but uh in this instance this person who killed helen didn't have the key so the only way out was out through the back door and he had taken a lamp and left it in the back back of the like, kitchen area and gone out the back door and climbed over the fence that closed in the backyard of this place but in leaving, left his cloak, and people tied Robinson to this murder by saying he had had a cloak like this. So anyway, he's the person of interest. So that's the circumstantial evidence. Go to the next slide. Now, Bennett, 
he goes to great detail looking at everything. Um, he is interested in all these details about the murder, and he writes down this account that you're seeing here. Um, and some more of it that was in here said he did not fail to linger over the dreadful bloody gashes on her brow and the strangely beautiful burned skin, bronzed like an antique statue. Her face was calm and one arm draped over her breasts while the other raised and circled her head. He, uh, he managed to pack violence, gore, sexuality, and beauty into his writing. And he really got people's interest when he wrote up about the story. He just like, one of his things, he says, her beautiful bust had been split down the middle and probably peeled back. Well, actually what happened was he actually examined her body in more detail after the coroner had actually done his autopsy on her. So he's describing some of the stuff where they cut her open and everything else, rather than the actual stuff that had been done to her from the blow. Wait a second, Larry. Was this on the banks of the Ohio? Yeah. <laughs> Makes you wonder, doesn't know this was in this was in New York. <laughs> next, what have you done? Yeah, next, next, next slide. <laughs> okay. So he writes in here, you know, oh, he burst in. He says, you see all this. Okay. And here's one of his accounts here where, where you can read how he was like really building up what was going on here and about the corpse and what she looked like and everything else. And evidently people weren't used to a lot of this kind of writing. Um, he, you know, he, he, it says here the, in one of the accounts I read, the tragedy of Helen Jewett still continues to agitate the public mind. Not the slightest pause has taken place. Who is the murderer? It cannot be possible that Robinson was the person. How could a young man per perpetuate a so brutal an act? It is not more like the work of a woman? Are not the whole train of circumstances within the ingenuity of a female abandoned and desperate? This is another account from a paper about this. It was like, oh boy. And of course, the readers were really avidly sucking this stuff up. Go to the next slide. You can see what the aftermath was once the article was, was printed. Uh, the sales of the New York Herald skyrocketed and any other stories associated with this murder. In fact, uh, an excerpt I've got from all that's interesting article said that the media storm surrounding her murder was simply about gaining the highest readership through the most salacious stories about the case. And indeed, it worked. After the Herald printed the killer's purported letter, some a letter that ends up coming up and they print, said the newspaper circulation jumped from a measly 2,000 to 15,000 copies daily. <laughs> Everybody was like eating this stuff up. Kind of reminds me of the news media. Okay, go to the next slide. Hey, Larry, Larry, let me add something. That Bennett actually bought the New York Herald the year before this, and and this is he's the owner of it. And uh, this story is what really propelled the New York Herald. Yeah, I mean, like, oh wow, everybody's. It, it reminds me of an expression I've heard before: "If it bleeds, it reads." And I thought this was from you know more of our time period, but evidently people were catching on as early as you know 36 here. There's and then of course Robinson is taken to trial, and there's this publicized trial that goes on he ends up being acquitted because it's all purely circumstantial evidence but um the fascination that people have about this whole murder and how it was publicized continues and persists through other kinds of articles uh go to the next slide you'll see uh stories actually begin to appear go to the next up um, you, you get these fictionalized accounts about the life of Helen and her relationship with Richard Robinson, of course, which is all fixed, you know, full of, it's fictitious. You know, uh, you get these exposés that talk about how she lived this carefree life and everything was fine and dandy. And then all of a sudden fell upon hard times, was homeless and destitute. And she comes to the city, go to the next slide. And she finds a new job where she has someone who she, she works for, and then she begins to have suitors and everything else. But then he once again falls into bad ways, and he ends up at this brothel, which is the next slide. And, of course, then her life is, you know, cut short in an untimely way. And, uh, and she's at Rosalina Townsend's establishment, the, the House of Ill Reproof. Um, and anyway, go to the next slide. After this, you know, it completely changed how accounts were, were done. Uh, and this is why 
I was thinking, and I inserted in the next slide after this one, um, the little definitions here for people. I thought this stuff was in our time period, but evidently yellow journalism found a lot of its birth during this time period. And you'll see here how it's described where anything can be used and really pumped up to increase sales. Uh, you go to the next one, which describes um, tabloid journalism, where they'll tape things and blow it way out of proportions as well to sensationalize news and sell stuff. And then we go to the last one, which gives us a little bit more of an understanding of sensationalized news. This is an article that was done a couple of years ago. And I copied in some of this information here because I thought it was pretty significant to this because uh, these types of news techniques um, don't necessarily tell the truth anymore, just the truth and nothing but the truth. Um, they give only bits and pieces. You go to the next slide and we have the purpose of a lot of this stuff you read in here, it's, you know, increase the ratings, increase the readership. Um, you know, instead of covering something that might be, oh, this event happened, it can go on for weeks, which sounds so similar to things that we've been experiencing. And, and of course, the facts get exaggerated. Um, the truth isn't really there <laughs> for everybody to really see. It's hard to actually weed through it all. And then we go to the next slide and which ends up really creating a lot of misinformation and a lot of doubts by people about the accuracy of news. Um, this kind of stuff evidently is not new, which is why I gave it the title uh, I did and ended it with these three questions at the very last slide, which I wondered, you know, like, you know, why, you know, why did I title it this the way I did? Uh, nothing new under the sun. Um, you know, what, what kind of similar similarities do we see? Can we draw on this for uh, reporting news today? And, uh, and how does this kind of journalism impact the public in general and influence the views of individuals towards events? And of course, this kind of reporting, it, when it was being used, was very, uh, I guess you could say, uh, influential in uh, getting people's opinions and turning them towards different types of stuff. I read a number of articles at least six different articles that were about this. There have been books written about it and a whole slew of uh, other references they have that I'd be glad to supply anybody if they're interested. I might have put them in the next slide if that isn't the last one. That might be the last one. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's it. It's pretty, it's pretty small, but there's, there's a whole bunch of sources there with live links to go to articles, some books and things that people have done where they studied this event and how it changed the entire animal that we call journalism. So, hey, Larry. yep. That was interesting. Uh, you guys will see the tie-in uh, when I get, uh, when I wrap things up and you'll see how Bennett took this exact uh, um, application of news media into the March of 1861. You know, <laughs> actually, he was, I think his intent, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I think his intent in 1861 was really to make something happen. I think he was trying to create a false narrative that everything was going to be fine. And uh, he tried really hard. We'll see some, some clippings of it. But, but, uh, at, but before we do that, then let's go ahead and go to uh, Logan. Logan, uh, do you want to share your screen? Yeah. I, I think you can. I'll share my screen. Okay, go ahead. I'll tell you what. One, one day, guys, I'm going to learn what I'm doing. Not yet, but I'm going to learn it. <laughs> Go ahead and try it because right now it says multiple participants can share. So go ahead and take it, Logan, and see if it'll work. Can you all see this? Uh, yeah, you are doing something. You're making something happen. There you go. Ah, unbelievable. All right. <laughs> Woohoo. <laughs> all right. Since I have right. my technological savviness, I will begin this presentation on some of the events that happens in March and some of the stuff I think is important to our, as us as being reenactors and trying to be historically accurate, I'm gonna take some look at early war uniforms, which Manassas is of course the big early war battle and see if we can um, fix our impressions to be more accurate to that battle. So first off, um, I'm gonna be talking about the Confederate flag. After that, I'll be moving to how the Confederate government 
actually banned the African slave trade. And then I'll talk briefly about the moral tariff and then we'll go into the Manassas uniforms. So um, the first Confederate flag was created in March of 1861. It has these seven white stars in a circle on a blue black ground with three stripes, two red and one white. And if you notice, this looks very similar to another flag we all know and love. And that would be of course the American flag. And um, this is the first Confederate flag. So whenever you see someone, most of us probably know this at this point through our study of civil war history that this, that the Confederate battle flag, the stars and bars is not the first Confederate flag, this is. And this actually has seven stars because of the seven succeeding states. We will not, the 13 stars are not added. We will not have 13 stars until the upper Southern states succeed and also two more to represent Kentucky and Missouri, which in the government, in the Confederate mind, they had succeeded. They were just never able to due to the Yankees. And so it was also kind of a good um, rallying point because if you have 13 states rebelling against tyranny in their minds, it's kind of similar to what their um, grandfathers were fighting against England. You know, you had 13 um, states going up against King George. Now you have, um, you had 13 colonies going up against King George. Now you have 13 seceding states going up against the tyrant Abraham Lincoln in their minds. So we have the African slave trade. I actually was very hard pressed finding information on this. Most of the, the first thing that popped up when I typed in why the Confederate ban, why did the Confederates ban the African slave trade was more so a debate on whether or not that proved the Confederates were moral or not. Not really that much on, um, I didn't seem like it was gonna go into the reasons why. So I'm, if anyone has a little bit of info on this, they would like to share, that would be greatly appreciated. But I did from reading it, doing other reading on Confederate views of slavery. We of course know they made lots of laws supporting it. So why do we have this one law that's against it? Where well, the Confederate constitution is adopted from the American constitution. And we know that, um, America had also banned the African slave trade. And according to the Charleston Mercury, one of the newspapers that frequently pops up in our day by day reading, if anyone else reads that, it's really great. That's why this, I didn't even know this until I read this. And I thought this was really great info. So I made sure I went back and found this. I believe it's on March 6. And there was one guy named William Bapham Jr. who writes a letter to his friend. And he talks about how the Confederates are banning the African slave trade and how he's happy about it. And so I thought that was rather interesting. And then we have the article from the Charleston Mercury that's wondering why they have banned the African slave trade because in their mind, the Charleston Mer Mercury, the Confederate government was, the immediate cause for the formation of the Confederate government was slavery. So why would you ban the African slave trade? So according to the US constitution, the African slave trade was equal to piracy, a very heinous act in those days. So they were, they were making the point that maybe, you know, it's just piracy. Why would we have this? Uh, so mostly when I looked this up and tried to find resource on, resources on it, I never really found any um, historical information from a historian or anything like that. I found mostly sites where you could just ask a question, just anybody with any experience could answer. So I got varying answers. So none of these you know, we don't have, they don't have credibility behind them, at least not to my knowledge, but they appeared, they varied from all sorts of things, such as Confederacy didn't have a strong Navy. They would have to go against the British Navy because the British were the first to ban the African slave trade and the British had a very powerful Navy. They had other things where possibly um, they took the words of Virginia, of someone, this person supposedly had a quote from Virginia, a, someone from Virginia making this statement about how the African slave trade would put harm to the business of slave trade in the southern states. Um, but the thing is the African slave trade was banned before Virginia joined the Confederacy. So if I could find a source on that quote, also, you know, Virginia's wishes, if that is a real Virginia quote, then again, we don't have credibility from this person who just answered this question. Um, Virginia had it seceded at the time, so the wishes of Virginia are not in the mind of the Confederacy. We know most of the, Confeder the Confederate states are Southern. Doesn't necessarily mean Virginia and these already seceded states agree on every single topic. So it you know, seems Logan, kind of- Logan, you know, you know, 10 years prior to this, 
there was talk in the whole nation about how to eliminate the slave situation by, by perhaps paying the owners money from the government, et cetera. There was discussions like that going on long before this. And probably, I'm just guessing this completely, I have no, no, back, no uh, proof of this, but I would suspect they didn't want to add uh, more complications to it. They, they already had a big population of uh, slaves in the country, and they already were talking about how are they going to uh, get rid of the institution of slavery. Um, so why continue add to the problem? You know what I mean? So they probably said, we probably have enough. Let's go ahead and deal with what we have and, and put a ban on the rest. I'm just guessing. That kind of makes sense to me, you know? That was actually going to be my next point is that I have been reading a book called The Politically Incorrect Guide to the American Civil War. I really enjoy it. I showed you The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, which did have a section on North-South Division, the Civil War, and the Reconstruction. Some Many of those points are reset in this book, while many new ones um, I actually learned a lot of new information. But the author was making this point how Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee believe slavery would die away naturally. How once it's had its use, it would go away. We know Robert E. Lee was no fan of slavery. Jefferson Davis, according to the book, he was he was a slave owner, but he was more of, uh, you better treat your slaves right because they're gonna be working for you. And that's the only way they can, in his mind, do their job good. You want, you know, they're your laborers, you want them to do good. So he was like, you have to treat them nicely. So in the immoral trade of slavery, Jefferson Davis was, considered more the more moral character. It was a very small way to operate morally, but he was leaning more to a more moral approach to it. So he believed slavery, once its use was over, it would just die away, which also Robert Lee, I believe, have us quote how good Christian patience would end slavery. And I've also noticed that my reading of American literature, how one of the great abolitionists was actually not a Christian. He didn't talk that highly of Jesus. And a lot of the Bible. So I always wondered if, you know, the very religious South ever looked at one of these leading abolitionists who was not necessarily a Christian, ever like, man, we probably shouldn't listen to this guy. I mean, he's he does, he's not Christian, but we are, so we must be right. So that kind of just put my thought, you know, Robert E. Lee, believing Christian patience, might be looking at this abolitionist who's not necessarily Christian, but it's very big because he's a uh, proficient writer and his literature is going about so everyone's hearing about him and that's become the face of abolition so i could see it as you have said clay um girl that this was going to basically make slavery less complicated and eventually solve all the problems yeah. in the future that it would die away fade away with the wind be gone with the wind if you want to say it that way so then we have this short little thing on the moral tariff when this popped up in the day-by-day -day thing i noticed that there wasn't that many news reports on it. They're just the one they showed on the day by day was a small little section on how James Buchanan wrote up a new tariff that was slightly higher, that was much higher, I guess, than um, the preceding one in 1857. It was like, well, this seems, you know, tariffs, that was a pretty big issue. I wondered why it wasn't talked about. Then I realized the South is already seceding. This country's in turmoil. So why would you make a bunch of headlines about an issue that might possibly um, sever the ties even more. And then researching the moral tariff, I stumbled across some information where England over on the other side of the Atlantic is looking at the events going on in America. And is that this time you're thinking the moral tariff is the direct cause of the Civil War or that um, it's at least another barrier to them reconciling. We just know in February, we had that peace conference, which I also did a presentation on, and how that really didn't solve anything and wasn't that great at bringing peace to the nation. So I found it interesting that the press had these varying reactions, like the other article where it actually talks about how the tariff a lot more, when I researched this, was a lot longer and a lot more talkative about it, but it was dated to after it was enacted in March, probably like April and, or June, if I remember correctly. And so now that probably they felt, well, the South has seceded. Now we can talk about this and talk about, we can do the moral tariff because the Confederacy, the Southern states have left and the South doesn't like tariffs. This also turned out it provided Confederacy with a possible ally, England, because tariffs push away incoming ships. So foreign nations, and that's why the Confederacy liked it. They like trading their cotton with the world while the North liked protectionism. So they like these big tariffs. 
So when the North created this big tariff, they created another problem with England that was going to have to be navigated in this oncoming war. So now you know, we I have... Why, I wonder why Bennett didn't jump on this and make a big issue of it in the New York Herald. Because, you know, all the stuff I was reading in the last month, he didn't say much about it. Interesting, huh? That's what I'm thinking. I wonder if they know that they probably should have kept their um, mouth shut yeah. and instead of causing more division because already we're seeing a lot. Yeah. So I, I have a, co a collection of some paintings that um, are supposed to represent Manassas. And can anyone point out anything special about the uniforms here? They, they wore blue and some wore green. Yes, that's exactly right. It's how we have these officers right in front um, leading these Confederates. We have this guy over here with the nice, um, don't know exact name of that, covering his neck from the sun. And so I thought that would be an interesting thing is if we go to Manassas, if some of our um, officers would like to wear blue as if they have um, previous service in the United States Army or if they um, somehow, some way acquired some blue uniforms. Also, we see a lot of these neck coverings. We see a lot of them. I also really like this um, pick painting because it's in our history book. And we're actually in the section right now of the decade before the Civil War. So we're getting really close to my history book to the Civil War also, which is really great. So we have another painting. Here's this one. This appears to be New York militia just from my um, watching history documentaries. These guys in bright red are New York militia. We have um, Confederates here. We have um, some with the Hardy hat over here, which I know we have some of those for when we um, galvanize and become Union to do, um, we do the Hardy's Brigade. Is that correct, Colonel? Yeah, I have so not galvanized. So. Second okay. Wisconsin, Hardy's, Hardy's Iron Brigade. Okay. Did I say Hardy's Brigade or Iron Brigade? Iron Brigade is what is it correct. Okay, Iron Brigade. So we have some, um, in this painting, we have some um, hardy hats. We have lots of slouch hats. We have some of these older Mexican wheeler caps. Mm -hmm. Only reason I know that's called a wheeler cap is before I joined reenacting, I went to a reenactment, I asked a Yankee what that hat was called. So we see, again, we have these sunshades on the Union guys. We see, this is a lot of militia. Again, we have these New Yorkers in these bright red uniforms. No, I'm not sure they're zouaves. Again, uh, we might have a guy in the background with a blue uniform. So again, we kind of have this um, lots of varying uniforms. Here's another painting of the Confederates. And we have this guy riding out in front with Union blue. He has, again, the Mexican War cap that was in the Mexican War, very big. And we have all these Confederates behind them again. We see the neck covering. So that appears very popular. And I believe this might be my last painting. So I found my book that is on Civil War uniforms at the how they were provided for the Florida, Alabama, and Georgia regiments, how the states provided them. They even had some humorous sections in there, how they were, the poor ladies of one city would make a uniform if they heard just a mere song, which I found rather funny. Excuse me, so, Logan. Logan, pardon me. Have, um, have you ever yeah. watched the movie Gods and Generals? I have not. I have seen Gettysburg recently, and I have seen be, the clip. That would be informative to you how the Virginians dressed in the beginning of that that movie with um, with Jackson and the colors and um, the hodgepodge. I, I would recommend that uh, over uh, some of the paintings you have. I think you'll find it's more even more accurate. I have actually um, seen some clips of them at Manassas, and I noticed that too. The hodgepodge. Um, I saw a lot of blue Yankee keppies on them, which I found rather interesting. This book actually does mention Second Florida. Um, they mention a member, um, Richard B. Walker, Company D, Second Florida. They have a nice little picture of him. And this book has some images I was going to share with y'all because it shows some of the crazy uniforms they were doing at the beginning. And another crazy thing that they show from Florida infantry is we they wore this thing called a Sicilian cap and it was popular with the south because it's sicilian so that's if y'all don't know if you ever look at a map of italy there's the boot of italy and at the tip of the boot there's a little island that's sicily my italian family come that's where i get my italian blood from my grandpa's full-blooded italian he um his parents were married in the states but they were both full-blooded italian and um 
they're from Sicily, so this is also really interesting to me, but there's this Italian struggle for independence happening at the same time as the Civil War. And the South was also fighting for their independence. And so they looked over at the Sicilians and the Italians, and they noticed they were wearing this hat, this um, Sicilian style stocking underneath their hat. And there's multiple pictures in this book of them wearing the same kind of stocking. There's one picture, if y'all can see that, of this man. And he has this stocking hanging underneath his hat. And that's called Sicilian style. There's another good look at it. There's a few uh, others. Uh, they even had some people. But Logan, is that covering, it's in the, behind his hat, is covering the back of his neck? Is that what it's doing? Like he'll just put it on top of his head and go like that? I'm not sure. It's kind of coming over his shoulder. Huh. I think they wore it underneath their hats. I can probably do some more research. They have a few other images. It pops up. Even some people would get miniature Confederate flags sewn for them and they would wear it as one. It actually pops up quite frequently. Um, here's another. This is some Alabama militia and they're wearing older style with Shakos. They help, they're holding their, their in their hands, those big tall hats we see in the War of 1812. Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of getting this picture that early war militia was kind of more fancy. They have epaulets and these big tall shakos. Here's another one. These guys all dressed out. Yeah. And so I know, I believe we have some articles in our library talking about how we shouldn't wear all these medals and buttons and fancy stuff because it was soon proved to be long about rearing in the field. Where considering this is the first major batter, battle, many people probably haven't learned that lesson of wearing the big shiny brass button. So I think that would be interesting if we made an exception this time and try to wear big brassy buttons and look all goofy and impractical, but historically accurate. I think they have a few more. I think it's spot on, Logan. I mean, you know, th this battle was going to be the only battle fought. This is the end of it right here. And everybody was looking for glory and this was their opportunity to shine. I think you're spot on. I really do. Thank you. We also have some more paintings, color paintings of some guys. We have two Alabama people here, and one of them is called the Mobile Continentals. If you look at a picture, I wonder why they were called the Continentals. Uh, there we are. There's the, it looks like he came straight out of the American Revolution. So again, just reinforcing that idea that we have lots of crazy, strange uniforms. We even have these European looking um, hussars with the crazy helmets and long tail feather on their helmets. So we're getting lots of crazy stuff going on here. So I think it would be, there's some more Here's some more Sicily, Sicilian caps, and this is probably gonna be the last image I show, is we have, there they are. They're wearing them on their head. So huh. how they wear them, and they would wear them underneath their hat. Interesting. I see it on the same picture. Are you showing pictures of soldiers or something? Yeah. Yes. We just, got... we just have the one picture. Oh, <laughs> they changed. <laughs> Yeah, the, the people that don't have the gallery view that sees the people are not oh. seeing anything you're doing, Logan. Darn it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, didn't I saw put, them. I like them. I had the book, so I never bothered to put them into the computer because oh, yeah. so I was, why bother? So now I apparently look very eccentric to some of these people who forgot to, who um, chose not to have gallery view. So I think it would be very nice if we figured out how to get some of these Sicilian style stockings and place them on our heads and somehow figure out how to do that. Try to, you know, wear some of these brassy buttons, look kind of goofy, and kind of put a hodgepodge as we see here and wear those okay. neck coverings in Union Blue. And we might, we really probably improve our authenticity if a lot of this is accurate information. Well, I think you're, you're, you're got, a, you have a great uh, addition to the unit by thinking like that. And uh, I, I, I commend you on that. Is Thank you. Uh, Captain or Colonel, may I add, um, early war, a lot of folks uh, wore uh, the uh, the battle shirts. And, oh, uh, absolutely. And, uh, and and when I heard you were going to do the early war, I'll be like Logan. Not everybody can see it, but I brought, I dug into my closet with the battle shirts. If I can get in it, I might wear that because um, the, typically they would have uh, 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 stylized pockets on each side as well. But mm -hmm. instead of being a... Um, uh, a shell jacket or a frock coat. It would just be a, just a shirt they would throw over like a hunting shirt and they called them battle shirts. That was very popular early war.
Uh, you, you had an interesting comment in there, if you can get in it. Now, what, what does that mean exactly? I'm sorry, my I wasn't. When you said, were you if, asking me? Yeah, yes, yes. Chat, if you can get in it, what do you mean by that? For what? Meaning, His uh, wife shrunk, shrunk it. Longer. Meaning, I think I need to go on a diet before I <laughs> before we go to Gettysburg. Okay, it was my son's. It. My, my it was my son's, and I kept it. But I might see if I can get it on. I know he can't wear it, but I might try. Hey, we need to welcome the new person here. Uh, George uh, is is a friend of Jake's. Uh, George had his video for a while, but George, can you can you hear us? Uh, yes, sir. Welcome, George. George. Uh, we want we want to welcome you. You're one of Jake's friends. If you're one of Jake's friends, you're one of our friends. You're here. Okay. Um, I tell you, what, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, first of all, that was great, Logan. I really did like that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up with uh, just to, I only got about ten slides here, and they're going to be pretty quick. But uh, um, and I'm going to tie in. Uh, some of the things that Larry did with this. Okay, um, of course, you can't, this is just March. This is, goes last in the last 30 days. Of course, you can't for, You can't not talk about March without talking about the inauguration of, of Lincoln. This was an interesting photo. You might've seen it. A show that talks about it here that he is under a wood canopy at the front midway between the left and center. I'm gonna put this on full screen here. Okay, so I went ahead and blew this up. Oh, wait a minute, it's not right. I got to put it on full screen with uh, windows, playing windows. Okay. Um, so I got blew this up and I guess that's not talk about, I guess that's him right there. I just thought it was interesting. So I want to include that. That's, that's March 4th. Now on March 7th uh, in the Charleston Mercury, um, there's somebody who's, who's watching the parade. And I thought this was interesting. It's crap in front of me here. He just says, I have just returned from looking at the inaugural procession from an upper windows of the Browns Hotel. And this is the Browns Hotel. I had a perfect view of the whole affair from the chief marshal with his aides at the head of the column down to the ragamuffins on foot are in dilapidated wagons at the tail. Truth compels me to say it was a poor show. Lincoln sat in an open carriage with Buchanan by his side and Pierce of Maryland with someone else facing him. It was my first glimpse of the mighty rail splitter. He did not seem as homely and vulgar as the prince and press represent him. But all sides agree with me. He is a low-flung, weak-minded man. Even the Republicans laugh at him. <laughs> so this here again, this is the, the, the media, the Charles and Mercury. Um, I included a picture of this because he mentions the Browns Hotel. So in my love of history, I had to look up Browns Hotel. Well, the Browns Hotel was built um, in 1805. It was called the Davis Hotel, but it was bought uh, and renamed in 1858 the Metropolitan Hotel, which is still there. So in 1858, it was the Metropolitan. So why in 61 did this guy say it was still the Browns Hotel? And I thought that was interesting to me. No, no significance to what we're talking about, but it was interesting to me. Okay, uh, so March 7th, this, this is only a couple of days after the inauguration. He learns from Major Anderson that Fort Sumter must be either resupplied or abandoned and within a matter of weeks. The president understands that surrendering the fort would mean a loss of federal sovereignty, but that sending supplies would likely start a war. He loses sleep over the situation. All right, John, March 7th. Braxton Bragg is assigned to command the troops in and near Pensacola. March 11th. Uh, this guy is interesting. We'll be talking a lot about him next month. That's guy's wigfall. He writes to Jefferson Davis. It is believed here in black Republican circles that Anderson will be ordered to vac vacate Fort Sumter in five days. An informal conclusion to this effect was arrived at Saturday night in cabinet. Anderson telegraphed. It is said that he and, and no fuel and but 15 days provisions. So wigfall is a, is a Texan who is a real strong Southernist. Uh, he believes in uh, slavery, he believes in um, a, a class system. Uh, he is um, an or orator. He is uh, Sam Houston's enemy in Texas, in Texas, and he's such a good speaker, they even think he's the reason uh, Sam Houston lost uh, the, the, the recent election. But at Wigfall, you're gonna hear more about him next month. Um, so again, on March 11th in the New York Herald, this is owned by Bennett, 
Political circles were feverishly excited today by a report that the evacuation of Fort Sumters and Pickens had been determined upon the cabinet meeting last night. So here you go. You know, this is uh, uh, the sensationalization of Bennett right now. Okay, down in, in Fort Pickens, uh, in Fort, uh, Fort Taylor, um, you have, let's see, I have the honor to report that everything is quiet in Key West. Uh, nor do I appreh apprehend any attack on this fort until perfectly organized force is raised. Uh, there's no reason to go on with this one. I just wanted to point out that Fort Taylor, nothing's going to happen. Down there. The only two areas of interest right now are Fort Sumter and Fort Pickens. Um, I could not find an image of Fort Sumter, uh, a, a 19, an 1861 image. It's the only thing I could find. I can find a lot of them afterwards, but, uh, so I, I went and included this. But on the 13th, the New York Herald, uh, the question as to the evacuation or reinforcement of Fort Sumter has been decided by the cabinet. The fort is to be evacuated and peace will thus be preserved. The order for the evacuation has, has not as yet been dispatched to Major Anderson, but it will be. We learn as soon as the fire eating Republicans have a time to exhaust their uh, impotent indignation with regard to the surrender. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is interesting. I thought this was pretty cool. This is, I think, on the 14th. Yesterday, an accident occurred at Cummings Point Battery. Now, this, this illustration appeared in um, the Harper's Ferry, um, but it was, it's actually drawn from an artist in Fort Sumter. So this is what they're looking at. Uh, this is all ironclad right here. And um, um, anyway, an accident occurred at Cummings Point Battery, which will doubtless be misrepresented in the Northern Papers. A squad of recruits from the regulars of the South Carolina Army were practicing at the heavy guns of Stevens Iron Battery. The guns were intended to be fired with blank cartridges. Uh, get this. Some person or persons accidentally or otherwise placed in cannon number three a ball cartridge. Now, I don't know how you do that accidentally. The order was given to load and fire the guns in their order. Number one fired, number two fired, and number three fired. It was noticed by the commanding officer that the recoil for number three was considerably greater than from the other guns. Suspecting something went wrong, he immediately jumped upon the top of the battery to assure Major Anderson that the shot was accidental. <laughs> I think that's just amazing. Um, the result of the shot could easily have been seen from uh, Morris Island. It struck near the gateway on, on Fort Sumter and ricocheted into the water beyond. Soon after the shot was fired, Major Anderson unmasked three of his guns bearing on the Cummings Point battery, but soon perceiving that the shot was purely accidental, he closed the portholes and made no further demonstration. Isn't that amazing? And I, want, I included this. I want you to see how close Cummings Point is. It's Fort Sumter. And that's the closest battery there is right there. Now, the first shot of the fire, uh, the war is going to come from Fort Johnson, but but for the purpose of this, that's where Cummings Point is. So that guy could have been the beginning of the war right there. Imagine if Anderson went ahead and fired back. Remember, he unmasked three of his guns. What if he fired back? Then uh, the beginning of the war would have been on the 13th of March. Okay, this is another picture I found of Cummings. This is a, a th uh, this is actually before the, the, the capture of Fort Sumter. And the only thing I can figure out is, see that right here, this little, I guess this is the horseshoe. I, it just doesn't look to me like the same thing. So that, this, is the, this is the illustration of it. That's a picture of it. So I, I don't know. I, I, I get too involved in it sometimes, I think. Okay, now it's the 20th. We're getting close to the end of the month. Um, Here's Bennett. Here's the guy that Larry talked about. He's the guy that owns the New York Herald that will soon become the New York Times. The, the news from Washington is important. Oh, I, I sent this to the union already. An armistice has been agreed upon between commissioners of the Confederate States Administration. And for a short time, at least no disturbances need be feared. Affairs at Fort Pickens have, have, Pickens have assumed a peaceful aspect and the commanders of the vessels off Pensacola have been instructed to await further orders. The idea of a peaceful separation seems now to prevail even in Republican councils, as indefinitely preferable to the assertion and maintenance of federal laws among a people who are determined to resist it. The evacuation of Fort Sumter will take place on Saturday, and Major Anderson and troops leave on the steamer Columbia for this city. Yesterday, 50 of the soldiers received their pay from the government. It is stated that the Confederate states will be generally recognized by the European powers. In 61, it circulated 84,000 copies and called itself the most largely circulated journal in the world. Now get the last quote. Bennett states 
The function of the newspaper is not to instruct, but to startle and amuse. So when I did this slide, I started looking into Bennett, looked at the beginning of the New York Herald and saw how it was founded in 1835. And I ran, came across how they became real big through the murder of uh, Helen Jewett. And that's when I, I had sent the note out, who will volunteer to do a, to see what the connection is. And the connection, which Larry, you made, is that um, that murder is what propelled uh, Bennett to make the New York Herald one of the best read papers in the world. And he did it by sensationalization. And he's doing it again right now. Uh, what his motive is, I don't know. Now, he is not a strong Republican. Uh, he is kind of a middle-of-the-road guy. For any of you guys reading the Charleston Mercury and the New York Herald, I see them both uh, printing pro-slavery, I mean, pro-North and pro-South, both of them. If, if I had to guess if one of them was leaning one way or the other, I couldn't do it. The New York Herald seems to be pretty much middle-of-the-road, if anything, more pro-Southern. So it's very interesting. I mean, I don't know whether he is attempting to create a narrative here or he's just trying to make sensationalism. I don't know, but I, I find it's, it's, it's the same dynamics we have going on in, in today. Okay, then I had a little, uh, we already talked about that. The New York Herald again, uh, let's see, again, this is from Bennett. The news from Washington this morning is highly important. The official order for the evacuation is issued on Friday. He keeps going, he keeps talking and talking about that narrative. Now, at the end of the month, this is last week, after days of deliberation, oh, here we go, and, and careful consultation with cabinet, Lincoln decides to resupply Fort Sumter and Pickens. Now, this is the first bit of news we have yet that suggests there might be a, a war, because the South clearly told Lincoln uh, that he, they will not allow him to reinforce or resupply. And so this on March 29th was the first time I've seen it. And I wanted to include this because at the as of April 1st, as the beginning of the month, we only have seven states. These seven here are the ones that actually have succeeded. And they've well, the, the only ones that only five of them actually ratified the Constitution, but they're going to Florida and uh, I think it's uh, South Carolina. I haven't quite done it yet, but they will. Almost done here, John. Okay, on April 4th, Mary Boynton Chestnut, who is a real socialite in Charleston. Uh, very fascinating to read her stuff. She's a very sophisticated writer, sometimes not really easy for me to follow. Um, not as easy, as, not, Larry's much easier to follow in his book than, than Mary Point Chester, seriously, Larry. Uh, but the, I wanted to, I, this is the kind of high society she lives. The supper was, was a consolation. Uh, this is because she couldn't hear her speech. Pate de foie, gras salad, salad, bisquil glace, and champagne frappe. I just had to put that in here. A ship was fired. Okay, this is important because this did happen last week. A ship was fired into yesterday. Let me, let me describe it. A, 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 a ship came into the harbor and from, um, um, I think it was Fort Moultrie, they actually fired into it because they thought it was going to resupply Fort Sumter. And you could actually call that the first shot. And she even says here, is that was that the first shot? How can one settle down to anything? One's heart is in one's mouth all the time. Any moment, the, the cannon may open on us, the fleet come in. So this happened, really. Uh, it was some, one, one day last week it happened, and she, she, she writes that. Now today, this is today, it's April 6th, Lincoln dispatches a State Department employee to inform South Carolina governor that the federal government will be provisioned Fort Sumter. The president makes it clear that no additional troops will be sent to the fort if supply ships are allowed to land, but if the effort is resisted, the fort will be reinforced. So this is the beginning of the conflict. And, and it's really a one week before the bombing. So I thought that was very significant. And the last thing I have, this happened today. Um, the sugar planter was founded in 19, it's, it's actually, it's a weekly four page newspaper printed over there in Louisiana, founded by this Hyman's guy. And he just points, he says, the Petersburg Express says that a popular restaurant in that city has concocted a drink called the Secession Trump. It's made up of an equal portion of brandy and sherry wine, well mixed with small pieces of lemon and orange, and flavored with a few grains of gunpowder. <laughs> it is quite palatable and very popular. When Virginia secedes, a few sprigs of mint are to be added, and this, this thought, will greatly improve the taste of the Secession Trump. 
<laughs> so that that concludes where, where where we are today. And that's all I've got on that one. Any any comments or questions or points on that? Anything of that that we saw tonight? Was was that the first drink on the uh, pub crawl? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I tried to find some connection to it, but I could not do it. Um, I think that the interesting thing think to Steve me. Cindy should add that to the menu for the next. You know. Yeah, I was going to say, Brad, you're in charge of that. <laughs> I wonder how much gunpowder they added to it, though. I mean, that doesn't sound very good to me. I don't know. Washington had his men uh, consume a, a teaspoon of gunpowder a day for the <laughs> health benefits. I don't know. Um, well, I know that concludes. I want to thank Larry and I want to thank Logan for adding to it. To the, now, next month, I need a volunteer who wants to talk about Fort Sumter. I think we should devote the hour to the bombing of Fort Sumter because it's a fascinating story. And it's open to anybody who wants to do it. You don't have to say today whether you want to do it, but we'll do that next month after our Gettysburg trip. Uh, is there anybody right off the bat who wants, would like to volunteer for it, or should I just wait for a, an a email? Okay, I'll, just, I'll wait for an email. Then. Um, how many here are going to Gettysburg? We got okay, it's going to be it's four of us here. Logan, you are not going to go, is that correct? I'm unsure. My um, dad would love to try to make it. The only problem is travel, such a long distance. Yeah. So that's the only, if I don't go, it's the only reason is because of travel. So it's still it's, unlikely. It's $40 walk on. Ah. Oh, it is? Yes. Wow. It's $25 registration now, but walk on, it's $40. Mm. Oh. I registered for 15 a long time ago. Uh, Chad, you registered? <laughs> Chapel, we need to know. Know. Yeah, I, both, both, uh, I register for both myself and Scott, so we're all set. Okay, all right. All right, uh, Brad, how about you? <laughs> if he's having an audio problem or something. That, that's he, a, he held up a paper. Yeah, I, I got mine right here. I, I registered a long time ago. Fantastic. All right, good. Um, you know, the, 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 the timing is kind of strange to me because I'm an avid follower of this 160. If you know, I, I read, I read, I, I miss a day. I don't read it every single day, but I, I skim through and I kind of know what's kind of going on. And, and right now, if this truly was 160 year, years ago today, and I was in the South or the North um, from what's being printed in the papers, and I'm reading the New York Herald, I'm reading the, the, the Charleston Mercury, I'm reading the one over there in um, the Shoe of New York, the, the Washington Post, the Washington Post. Harper's Fair, and all of them uh, are just trying to play everything down. And the narrative right now, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. Even Mary Boyd Chestnut doesn't. She's got her husband as a high-ranking colonel in the Confederate Army, good friends with Jefferson Davis. Even she doesn't think anything's going to happen. And, you know, this is the sixth. This is six days away. And uh, today is the first day, well, the, the not 29th, but this is the first time they're starting to say, okay, we are we are going to resupply the fort. Just so you know, I'm warning you, we're going to supply the fort. And this is where I bet you, as we speak, 106, they're talking right now. Beauregard is talking to Davis right now saying, hey, we better get ready because it looks like they really are going to do it. We already said if they do that, we're going to bomb them. And so now this is where we are. This is how close it's coming. And, and it's, it's fun following the history to me. You know, it's just fun. But us going to Gettysburg to do the first Manassas at this time period isn't correct. <laughs> you know, we're going too soon, but that's okay. You know, I'd rather go now than in June or July anyway. So, <laughs> but having said that, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted everything I need to say, but I really enjoyed it tonight. I really do. I, I, love, I love the history. I love sharing with mm -hmm. people. And good to see you back. Good to see you. Thank you. Looking skinny, man. You got to stop losing weight. You got to put some weight on. <laughs> what am I going to do? Keeps coming off. It's uh, <laughs> always better. Yeah, do you want to? Do you want to wear my battle shirt? <laughs> <laughs> you might probably can fit my battle shirt better than I. Yeah, it might fit. I don't know. Now, Logan, if you do, if you're even thinking about going, I would go ahead and get registered. It's better to lose twenty five dollars than have to pay forty. Yeah, that's my feeling. Keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, just talk it over with your dad and and see what you can do on that. Yeah. 
Let your okay. captain know as soon as possible so we can update the roster for rations. Yeah, I'll do that too. I'm trying to get those numbers for you, Sandy, but uh, so far the only ones responded so far has been Wayne with 15, and Porterfield said he thinks he's going to have eight, but I need to know. So I, you know, oh, I, the last time I heard about Porterfield was 15. Uh, he's not going all over the place, these guys. You know, it's, it's one of the frustrating <laughs> things about this hobby. People don't really want to. And are, are they? Are we supposed to feed them? Or are they just showing up up there to participate? If they, I'm going to, I'm going to put out a second notice for rations. Okay. Uh, and then when nobody responds, I'm going to say, so far, the only ones we have are Wayne uh, of the uh, second floor with 15. And then okay. I'll put final notice for rations. <laughs> and maybe I'll have a couple more that's going to tri tri trickle in. And we'll just going to, and whatever that final number is at the end is what we're going to go with. Okay. And, and Clay, then we, they, they can't keep this hanging over us, you know? So, yeah. Clay, if you recall, last time um, Porterfield's um, unit, uh, they cook their own meals, uh, so um, I don't know yeah, whether they had, want to participate or not. The well, last time he, they went to Gettysburg. Yeah, but he came to me and asked if they could participate. And remember, that's oh, okay. what you said, right. Steve. I, and, and yeah, he asked, so I'm just okay. following through is all I'm doing, you know? All right. Okay. Cindy, you remember Richmond a couple of years ago? We had just random people walking up and with money in a plate, like, hey, are you guys feeding us? Sure, come on. Can I have some watermelon? <laughs> but we told them we have to feed our own unit first. It would be whatever's left over. That's uh, fun. Has, has anybody looked at the weather forecast? Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't looked at it in about just a week. Just the one you sent out. Okay, all right. It probably hasn't changed. About 65 in the, during the day and mid 40s at night. Yeah, how, how can it get any better than that? You know? That's perfect. I don't know. Are we going to see any orbs while we're up there, Clay? Absolutely. You're, you're going to be in your sleep and they're going to be hovering over your head. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> we're we're going to be right by the Daniel Lady that, Farm. That's I just mean. the glare coming off my head. That's all. That is. <laughs> Brad, I've got an extra cross I'll loan you for up there. Well, you know, the Daniel Lady Farm, I posted a video on our homepage. I don't know if you guys saw it, only kept it there a day or two. I thought it was kind of hokey, but we had some Ghostbusters went in the Daniel Lady Farm. Anybody see that? Mm -hmm. Anybody see? Did you watch it, chap? <laughs> what What did you think of it? Well, I I watched it before. Is that what you're oh. talking about? Was this a repeat? Yeah. Before? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. I just thought it was much ado about nothing, to be honest. But um... Well, you know, they had this woman who was a she could see it, you know, and she would hold it. Oh, I mean, you know, what, what? And she was taken to a corner and she sat down on the corner. This is exactly where something happened. And she saw this is where blood was on the thing. And sure enough, right where she did all that is exactly where there's blood stains. Because because that night they came in with a, I guess not an infrared, but some type of, you know, black light kind of thing. I could see blood. And darn if right where she was, wasn't sitting, right where she was lured. There was the blood stain, and so she well, knew there was somebody there. Uh, I think oh. there was blood all over that barn, so yeah, but, you know, the odds of not finding blood would have been um, higher than than finding it, in my opinion. But again, I but, I think much of this is the power of suggestion. So, well, well the thing that kind of got me at the, the the thing that got me, chap, at the end, she had these crossbars that she was holding like this, and she said, "What is your name?" And then she goes, "Is did you say Richard?" Did, did, did you say Yule? Oh, it's like, it's like wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it was a little bit too contrived for me. But, and uh, so it to was still fair, interesting. OBJs and Wayne and I will start predicting things too. So, <laughs> but you know, well, you know Cindy I'm, and I will sneak over point. in the middle of the night and what? show you a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember last time we were at Gettysburg, two guys in Porter's Porterfield's unit, uh, Tim and Mark. Uh, you guys might remember them, but they're they actually believe in all that stuff. I, I'm not, I don't just count it. I, I, who knows what happens? You know, I mean, I don't know. Chap, you're the only one that knows for sure what happens. I know that. But but you know, but as far as ghosts, no, I don't know. You know, probably not. It's really far fetched. Anyway, so these guys came. I got a recording on their phone. It said, um, um, "Ghost beware" on the other phone. And he came up behind me, and we were. It, 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 it's a ghost beware. Ghost beware. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Jeff, do you do exorcisms? Every, every time I see them, we see each other, even at Narcusi. Ghost beware. Ghost beware. The, the only one. The only one I'm afraid of seeing is the um, 
owner of the farmer that owns that field that we cut across that might recognize us again and wants revenge. <laughs> well, you know what? I think all that belongs to the Daniel Lady Farm now. Um, okay, and I'm getting, good. I'm getting frustrated with Kirk Davis because I, I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times. I, I want to know where we're camping. So I took an aerial view this morning of the Daniel Lady Farm and that whole field chap that we went across is bare now. Oh, and, okay. and Sontag told me, my understanding is that whole field is bare and beyond that is bare. And that's what Daniel Lady Farm now uses for camping in battlefields. But I don't know that for sure. So I took it. I asked Kirk Davis yesterday and he said, well, let's go to the website. Everything's there. There's nothing on the website about a camp layout or anything. So I took mm -hmm. a picture of, of, of using Google Earth and sent it to him this morning with, with, and, and put A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Where are we camping on this thing? And so I'm going, once I get the information, I'm going to send it to you guys. I, I like to know that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay. well, thanks for all your uh, preparation oh, it's and fun. Um, advanced planning. We appreciate it. It's fun. Now, you guys already saw the uh, the March, and uh, um, I'll I'll do I'll send another email. I put that together in a little different way. That's a little easier, uh, and we're gonna know exactly where they went. And that information came from a couple different map sources I used, so I know that that's pretty accurate. And it's interesting that we really did start. From the Florida Monument, um, and day two we're going to go to the right of Spangler Farm, and day three we're going to actually start over Armistead did. So we're going to essentially do very close to the same thing, and uh, it's interesting. It's I love reading about it because on day two we're we're in front. I'm sorry, day three we're in front of um, Garnett, and the Garnett's going to pass it, and so if we re relive it, you know we're going to be passing these four guys are going to go into the front and we're just going to watch them go off to our left because if the field's real smoky we're going to lose them and these guys are going to be marching parallel to the federal uh, line parallel so you know any fire that's coming down it's unbelievable to me and they're only i guess from emmitsburg road to uh, hancock uh, where he was right there is probably only about 200 yards maybe probably 200 yards at the most. So these guys are marching parallel all the way to the Katori farm. It's amazing to me. And now we're gonna, of course, we're gonna get lost and veer off to the right in the smoke of the Florida Brigade. But we'll, we'll, we'll cover all that in a couple of weeks. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Anybody else got anything else? If no one has volunteered to um, uh, carry the colors, uh, I'm willing to do it. So you could use me as a, as a uh, alternate, so to speak. Well, I tell you what, you're the first one to mention it. So you're gonna start with them. Okay. <laughs> you got be good. It. All right. Good. Anybody got anything, Brad? Dan, want to say anything? I'm, I'm good. Well, what, what, what's that shirt of yours? Dogs of War. What is that? Dogs of the War. That would go. Oh, okay. Cool. Yep. Yep. All right. Sure. I, I like yours, Brad. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Anybody want to share their shirts? Mine's ECF. Of course. Clyde, you got a shirt you want to share with us? Yeah. Of course. Uh, that's, that's boring. That's boring. Kex, you got anything interesting? No. Bad, boring. Logan? I do, actually. What? Let's see it. What? Let's see. Uh, oh, shirt wise. I thought you were talking about info. <laughs> but no, I don't have an interesting shirt other than my school uniform I'm wearing that has our school name on the, the cross in the shape of an anchor that has a cross on it because we're. Souls Harbor. So since okay. we're a harbor, our our um, logo is a cross, but the bottom is the anchor part. Okay, cool. Very cool. Uh, Clay, would you like to see my new tattoo? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that would blow everybody's mind, Chop. <laughs> oh my, sorry. Can't control myself. <laughs> You must have been on a pub crawl when you got that. I put extra sugar in my iced tea. <laughs> you know, I, 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 Chapman, I talked about this today. A pub crawl doesn't mean you have to drink alcoholic beverages. A pub crawl, like my, my wife went on a pub crawl with us. She would not drink alcohol, but she would just, she'd find us all probably annoying and obnoxious after a while, but she would still go. So you don't have to drink alcoholic beverages for a pub crawl. Yeah. 
that was uh, that was uh, my lunch conversation with my wife, and she reminded me I could just drink ginger ale. That would be fine. There you go. You see? Well, on pub calls all the time in Savannah. You don't have to drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this there. this is from our last pub call. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Paul, you missed you missed the conversation. Well, the reason we're talking about pub crawls is uh, we were around the camp in our cruise ship, and Chap came up and he said, that, "I forgot." He, he somebody was talking about this term called a pub crawl, and yeah. he was kind of kind of you know confused with it. I said, "Chap, you realize that's been around a long time." <laughs> I, I was trying to be one of the guys, so I thought I would share some new information with you. You know, you know, kind of like yeah, I know something. I think back then it was a camp crawl. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's that's where all that came. From. Oh well. Well, that's all I got, guys. Great seeing you. Great, right. great talking. Take care. God bless you all. Good night. Good night. I hope we see you up there. Yeah, yeah, Logan. Hope so. That'll be great, man. Uh huh. Good night, yeah, everybody. Tell Sarah, good night. Good night. Night. All right. Safe all right. travels.